Chapter One of Dead Love Has Chains by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. Dead Love Has Chains by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter One lady mary harling was going back to england after a winter in ceylon she was too idle too utterly without ambitions or views to be free from chronic illness she suffered from a tendency to asthma in a very mild form always talked of by herself and her friends as her asthma as if it were a rare and peculiar malady while there were dressmakers assistants and factory girls in london reckoned by thousands who were afflicted in the same manner and who took the thing as a matter of course just an occasional shortness of breath that made hard work in long hours a shade more irksome in whitechapel and bermondsey it was everybody's asthma occasioning frequent visits to the dispensary in hertford street mayfair it was lady mary harling's asthma and a theme for fashionable physicians to expatiate upon with unctuous solicitude meditating or seeming to meditate profoundly before they advised the precise spot upon this globe that would be best for their cherished patient in the coming winter last year it had been a swan and the year before it had been cairo and the year before that st moritz and before that meran this last winter had been spent in ceylon and lady mary was going home bored to death with all that she had seen and done the gardens temples palaces bazaars people most of all the white people she knew in england she was going home not happy but resigned knowing that there was more boredom waiting for her the impalpable invisible black devil of ennui in town and country in her too spacious house in hertford street in her fine old georgian mansion in hampshire on the edge of the new forest needless to say that lady mary had one of the best cabins midship on the upper deck of the electra one of the finest steamers recently built by the most renowned company trafficking in passengers only between the thames and the hoogly it was a cabin for three adapted for one and in a smaller cabin on the same expensive deck she had her maid and her souffre douleur a dowerless kinswoman of six-and-twenty whom she had taken to herself eight years before when the girl was young and pretty and when her friends hoped that in such distinguished surroundings she might make a comfortable or even a brilliant marriage the poor child's chances in the matrimonial line were blighted by a terrible sorrow that came upon lady mary in the second year of daisy meredith's service a calamity that put a sudden end to all foregatherings of the young and lively in hertford street or at cranford park as years wore on lady mary had seen more society but she seemed to have taken an aversion to young people and never had any of them about her i can't amuse them and they don't amuse me she said when her intimates accused her of cultivating dullness she let the cranford shooting and gave the money to a bournemouth hospital her friends were all of them past forty some grave and learned some frivolous and pleasure-loving but none young from young men in particular she shrank with a kind of disgust she could better put up with girls this was a consequence of the great grief that had come upon her suddenly when daisy meredith was nineteen daisy at twenty-six had made up her mind to a life of spinsterhood and did not even know that she was still pretty she was attached to her friend and protectress who had taken her from a shabby home in an interminable road in the dismal north of london and from her place as buffer between a father and a mother who quarrelled incessantly when they were together and who occasionally separated but always made the mistake of coming together again the life in hertford street was elysium after the life in the seven sisters road and daisy was able to be of more use to her mother by little gifts out of her handsome allowance than ever she had been as a buffer the allowance was called pocket money and everybody knew her as a useful cousin and not a salaried companion somewhere in the hull of the ship there was a footman whose most arduous duties during the voyage were limited to the careful placing of her ladyship's deck-chair rugs and sun-umbrellas on the promenade deck generally wrong as to wind and sun till corrected by one of the ship's officers and in fetching and carrying books and magazines and work-bags at miss meredith's bidding like most women of large means and no ambitions lady mary was an accomplished needlewoman deeply interested in every revival of old art and pictorial embroidery her latest task was a panel for a screen a landscape of dutch formality with a row of poplars in a laborious raised stitch every tree requiring months of patient toil the panel closely veiled in tissue paper was stretched on a frame and to establish this conveniently for lady mary's labour was a work of time 
it gave the cousin and maid and footman something to do every morning either on the open deck or in the ladies drawing-room and to re-establish it in her ladyship's cabin after luncheon lady mary had acknowledged to eight-and-forty for the last three years but was believed from the evidence of history to be older she had been seventeen years a widow and was still handsome enough to bring no shame upon handsome clothes dress was a subject to which she gave serious thought and she considered herself successful she loved bright colour in her houses and in her gowns i had rather be garish than dull she told people that great sorrow the unutterable grief of six years ago had spread so dark a pall over the life of the heart that she had been forced to take pleasure in externals i have only things to interest me she said i am always bored but i make a good fight against boredom she was a member of the dante society and took a keen delight in their proceedings and read a little dante every day as piously as her bible she took daisy meredith to all the best concerts of the season to hear all the old favourites and all the new prodigies on piano or fiddle it is good for you if it sometimes bores me she said so it will be seen that daisy meredith did not eat the bread of tears albeit no lover had come a-wooing the double cabin that daisy shared with margot the devoted provencal maid was near the stern lady mary's neighbours on one side were a colonel and his wife and on the other side there was a two-berth cabin occupied by a young lady from calcutta with her maid a young lady who was too ill or too unhappy to appear in public and whom lady mary had not seen she had encountered the maid several times in the corridor a middle-aged woman sour-visaged and severe i'm afraid your young lady is very ill she said to the maid one morning i heard her sobbing and moaning last night the woman pinched her lips and answered curtly hysterical she brushed past lady mary and disappeared in the cabin what a churlish person to have charge of a sick girl thought lady mary full of pity for the distressed fellow-creature whose low moaning broken now and then by a suppressed sob had kept her awake between two and three o'clock in the morning they were in the stifling heat of the red sea and every porthole was open and sounds were audible from cabin to cabin the moaning sound was in the hot heavy air when lady mary fell asleep and she heard it again when she awoke at six o'clock after that there was only silence in the girl's cabin and no sound of speech all the morning though lady mary could hear the door opening and shutting the maid going in and out the clinking of cup and spoon when the girl was taking her breakfast no speech she thought much of this solitary girl after her encounter with a cross-grained attendant girls are not hysterical for nothing the moaning and sobbing in the silent night hours could only mean mental distress what was the sorrow that watched with her in those dreary night hours was it grief at being parted from a lover or mourning for some near and dear one lately lost father mother sister brother and to be solitary in her sorrow with no one near her but her hard-featured unmannerly maid lady mary's heart went out to this unknown girl in her loneliness a heart full of pity and yearning i must do something she thought i can't lie here night after night like a log while that girl hugs her sorrow surely sympathy soothing words from a motherly woman might bring her some little comfort she had said no word about the lonely girl to daisy who was all kindness for her fellow-creatures nor to her maid margot whose exuberant southern nature would have been quick to pity eager to console if it were only by offering to retrim a hat or devise something new in hairdressing lady mary felt that those secrets of the night season the sorrow with which proximity had made her acquainted were not to be told to the first comer something she felt she must do and one sultry breathless day when the maid had gone to her dinner lady mary knocked gently at the door of the next cabin a fretful voice answered quickly come in and then as the fine matronly figure the handsome face and silver hair appeared in the doorway i thought it was the stewardess continued the voice rather more fretfully you've come into the wrong cabin the girl was sitting on her sofa berth wrapped in a loose white dressing-gown her hair coiled in a great careless knot on the top of her head her bare feet in red slippers without heels lady mary's keen vision realized every detail she looked slovenly forlorn uncared for out of health but she was exquisitely beautiful her face shone in the cramped cabin space like a light her form was no less exquisite the muslin dressing-gown hanging loosely over the lawn nightgown revealed every line of the perfect figure 
but while the matron's eyes gazed at her in startled admiration the girl snatched up a large soft shawl that had fallen on the floor and wrapped it hastily around her no there is no mistake lady mary said gently i am in the next cabin and knowing that you were quite alone i am not alone i have my maid yes but she is not a companion for you very useful no doubt but no companion i don't want company i prefer being alone thank you there was a pause before the last two words and the tone was not over gracious my dear young lady i have heard you sobbing in the night i can't help having ears you know and i should like so much to be of use to you i thought perhaps i might help you think of pleasant things to put aside your grief now and then to take courage and to face life bravely no life is all sorrow it is easy to say that i dare say you have been lucky and have never known what trouble means you look like that a woman of fifty as perfectly dressed and coiffée as lady mary always was is apt to give that impression and her appearance certainly made a marked contrast to the girl's slovenly forlornness she had drawn her feet up onto the sofa and sat huddled in the big red shawl making herself as ungraceful a bundle as she could but the lovely head and throat the perfect shoulders the shining copper browns of her hair the large hazel eyes and red sorrowful mouth could not be hidden mary harling looked at her with a sad reproachfulness i have known a great sorrow a sorrow that went very near to break my heart she said gravely i beg your pardon the girl said quickly and then looking at her visitor with great angry eyes like a wild beast at bay she said and in the days of your great sorrow perhaps you didn't much want to see people especially strangers that will do said lady mary you must kindly pardon my intrusion which i sincerely regret she had left the cabin and shut the door before the girl could reply i am an officious old fool she told herself angrily as she shut her own cabin door a little more sharply than usual three minutes afterwards there came an impetuous knock on the panel come in said lady mary the door opened quickly and the girl appeared the red shawl skewered round her with a gold safety pin and her long white dressing-gown trailing on the floor i am sorry i was rude she faltered you meant to be kind to me there was a sullen air even in her apology but lady mary saw the lovely red lips quivering the eyes strained as if to keep back tears sit down she said kindly and drew the girl on to her sofa and put a down pillow behind her shoulders i did mean to be kind i wanted to cheer you if i could it must be sad to be alone on a voyage or with only a maid and yours doesn't seem a pleasant person she's a horror but i suppose she means well she is extremely respectable she said the last words with a curious sneering emphasis that did not escape lady mary she has a daughter who is the very pink of respectability the girl went on becoming suddenly voluble she is always talking of herself and her daughter it is her only idea of conversation her daughter passed all the standards at a board school and went into service at seventeen she was perfection as a children's maid in the great house and at nineteen she married the head gardener and her mistress gave her a wedding present and she never did anything wrong in her life never 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 that kind of conversation must be rather boring boring i turn my face to the wall and clench my hands and wish myself dead i always wish that but i wish a little more intensely when wareham is telling me about her daughter my dear girl you must not say that we have to make the best of our lot upon earth come what may you must let me be your friend while we are on the ship no matter how our ways are to be parted afterwards have you any nice books with you look at my travelling library my favourite poets and charles lamb and a dickens and a thackeray or two at my age old books are old friends is there anything there you would like to read the girl's eyes had been roving round the cabin where there was a gracious elegance in all the trivial conveniences and adornments that gave the key note to the occupant's life down cushions in embroidered muslin covers with soft silk frills indian coverlet and portiere of exquisite needlework writing cases work basket delicately bound books everything choice and graceful and pretty the belongings of a woman into whose life nothing sordid or ugly cheap or pretentious had ever entered 
and lady mary herself in her soft silk middle-aged gown with an old mechlin lace fichu fastened neatly with one large turquoise was in perfect harmony with her surroundings everything had the same air of calm superiority and everything jarred upon the girl's overstrung nerves i see you have jane eyre she said after a pause i should like to read that again lady mary took the volume out of the row of books in the shelf over her berth it was bound in dark green morocco with a good deal of gold work and inlaid with scarlet calf i made her as fine as i could because i am so fond of her she said as she put the book in the girl's hand the girl turned the leaves looking at the pages dreamily and gave a long heart-broken sigh how happy i was when i read this book she said presently and yet i thought i was miserable it was at school and novels were contraband that made us fonder of them one of the housemaids used to get them for us from the grocer bright red cloth books printed on cheap paper jane eyre was the gem was it a happy school oh pretty well as schools go i believe it was an expensive school there were only twenty girls and we had a fine garden tennis court croquet ground and we dined late and had to wear low frocks for dinner there was a great deal of fuss but i think most of the girls liked it i didn't lady mary was on the point of asking the whereabouts of the school but checked herself she wanted to obtain this girl's confidence because it seemed to her that the girl had sore need of a friend and the best way to win her from her sullen reserve was to refrain from asking a single question i'll take care of your lovely book the girl said rising to go and then as she neared the door perhaps you don't even know my name she said it is brown jane brown lady mary did not try to detain her she wanted the girl to get accustomed to the idea of a friendly neighbour pray come in and see me sometimes when you are bored she said i generally stay in my cabin between lunch and tea or would you not like to come on deck with me some fine morning i am sure the air would be good for you thanks no i hate the deck and i feel too ill to dress properly but if i may come here once in a way when i want to hear a human voice that is not wareham's pray come i shall be very glad to see you i am generally alone at this time my young cousin enjoys herself so much all the morning that she wants a long siesta i hear her laughing said miss brown she must be a very cheerful person she has a very happy disposition miss brown knocked at the cabin door at the same hour next day she was dressed quite neatly in a blue muslin morning gown and her hair was tidier those masses of copper-brown hair which lady mary admired she brought back jane eyre wrapped in tissue paper you must read very quickly said lady mary but perhaps you have only skimmed the book at a second reading no i read every word it took me out of myself i was jane eyre and not jane brown her troubles were my troubles i don't think she had so bad a time after all what not when she ran away from the man who worshipped her not when she was starving on the moor she must have been proud of herself all the time because she was worshipped by that stern strong man and because she had fought the battle and won and had never lost her self-respect i don't think starving on the moor mattered she knew he loved her she knew she had done a great thing in leaving him i believe she was always happy always after she knew that rochester loved her she dashed some tears from her eyes with an angry movement of her hand a lovely hand perfectly moulded only a shade too white for the beauty of youth and health mary harling was glad to hear her talk there had been no sobs or mourning heard in the night and no doubt the girl had read all night or had read herself to sleep anything was better than an incessant brooding on her own sorrows whatever those might be she sat on the cabin sofa nearly an hour watching lady mary at work upon one of her poplars the taper fingers drawing the silken thread in and out the hand now above now below the frame it seemed a work of ages your trees don't grow as fast as the poplars out of doors the girl said no it is slow work penelope might have tired out her suitors without the nightly task of unpicking there were lapses of silence with only the faint rustle of lady mary's silken sleeve as her hand moved to and fro presently after a little speech about indifferent things lady mary ventured a question i hope you are going home to relations you love 
i am going to a woman i never saw though she is my father's sister and you are going to live with her till your people come home yes i suppose so i have only my father and he will not leave india for the next three years i hope your aunt is a nice kind person and that her surroundings will be all that you like i don't care much for surroundings she must live in a house with walls and a roof and there will be air to breathe and food to eat and a bed to lie upon i am sorry to hear you talk in that despondent strain lady mary said very gently you are so young and forgive me for saying so lovely that it is cruel to think you can be without hope it is true all the same i have nothing to hope for and then after a pause and everything to dread she clasped her hands before her face struggling with her sobs then rose quickly and went to the door i am going back to my cabin she said it always hurts me to talk of myself lady mary put her arms round her and kissed her reluctant cheek then i will never speak of your own affairs again she said you shall have all my sympathy without a single question forgive me if i stirred the waters of mara they need no stirring they drown my heart day and night come to me again to-morrow and we will talk of only pleasant things and you must choose another book before you go thank you the girl surveyed the shelf slowly then put up her hand and drew out a slim volume half bound in gilded vellum the scarlet letter exclaimed lady mary oh that is such a painful story please let me read it my father took it away from me a year ago when i was not half through it is that your idea of girls that they ought to know nothing of the sorrow and shame that some women have to suffer some who are no older than themselves it is a difficult problem i have no daughter so i have not had to answer the question take hawthorne's work if you like it is exquisitely written but i am afraid it will make you sad lady mary woke in the dead of the night at the sound of stifled sobs in the next cabin the scarlet letter was not an effectual anodyne End of chapter 1chapter two of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the electra was nearing brindisi and a great many passengers were prepared to leave her cabin trunks handbags books umbrella cases and frivolities of all kinds were packed and ready for unshipping maids and valets were busy and on the alert for the work of landing lady mary was going home in a leisurely way meaning to break the journey and loiter at any place she cared for at venice at verona on the italian lakes with perhaps a week in paris to order gowns and hats and look about her in a general way she had friends among the haute noblesse in solemn houses in grey dull streets in the old st germain faubourg set back from the traffic of the stony street beyond the echoes of stony courtyards made more melancholy by funereal evergreens in great green tubs houses with double flights of marble stairs and a glass canopy over the door lady mary was a welcome visitor in many such houses and had the history of their owners engraved upon her capacious brain with all the relationships to the furthest cousin set down in a funeral letter she had known the orleans princes and their belongings at twickenham and ham and bushy park and stowe and she loved to talk of them a week in paris was a treat that she always gave herself after a winter in distant places jane brown was to stay with the ship to the bitter end i wish you were coming with my cousin and me said lady mary who had grown fond of the girl or as fond as jane brown would allow her to be jane had come to her cabin every afternoon staying a shorter or longer time as the spirit moved her conversation often flagged for the girl's reticence made it difficult and jane would sit in silence with a joyless face watching lady mary's needle almost as if it were a penitential task to watch a kind of intellectual crank exercising her mind upon useless labour she was always the same and in those many days of friendly intercourse mary harling felt that she had got no nearer to the suffering soul behind that melancholy outward form she knew that the soul was steeped in sadness but she knew nothing of the cause her guesses were painful for such persistent gloom in so young a creature must needs have a bitter root the girl had obstinately refused to be introduced to daisy meredith she is a good deal older than you but she would be more in sympathy with you than i can be lady mary urged 
she is still a girl very young for her age and so bright and cheerful she would do you good please don't ask me i like to sit here with you for a little while every day your kindness has let a ray of light into my life you you are such a lady you are so strong but i could not talk to a girl my life will never be like a girl's life again we should not have a thought in common mary harling brooded over that strange sentence my life will never be like a girl's life again from a girl who did not look nineteen such a speech argued utter ruin never again it argued the irrevocable the mischance that had changed the cup of girlhood from sweet to bitter a broken vow a trust betrayed a young life spoilt it was between ten and eleven o'clock on the night before they came to brindisi lady mary had dismissed cousin and maid and was sitting in her dressing-room reading one of those devotional books with which or with a chapter or two of holy writ she was wont to soothe her spirits before she tried to sleep to-night she had chosen a sermon of frederick robertson's whose discourses never wearied her though she knew them almost as well as the psalms he was her preacher of preachers the wisest the most delicate in apprehension the most generous in love and pity for his brother man there came a light knocking at the cabin door she knew the hand for it always seemed as if she could hear it flutter as it knocked shrinkingly timidly she went quickly to open the door come in come in my dear girl i had bolted myself in for the night but i am very glad to see you our last night together sit down and let us have our last talk the captain says we can land directly after breakfast i shall be at danielli's to-morrow night i wish you were coming with us how happy you look said the girl contemplating her with a kind of fearful wonder how serene and how strong i mean how strong in courage and resolution and yet i have had to bear sorrow that might break any woman's heart i used to think my heart was broken was it something very dreadful the death of some one you loved no thank god it was not death but it was only less dreadful than death but i don't want to talk of that you have never told me your trouble and i won't tell you mine only i want you to know that though i seem a frivolous over prosperous woman i have gone through the valley of the shadow and the shadow has been round and about me for six years of my life ah but you can hope you may come back into the sunshine some day after this there was a silence the girl sat huddled in a corner of the sofa her clasped hands resting on her knees lady mary noted the straining of the small hands the thin pale fingers interwoven you can keep yourself alive with hope she said after a long pause and then she burst into tears suddenly her forehead bowed upon the clenched hands her form shaken by convulsive sobbing there came a sharp knock at the cabin door and the maid's harsh voice you had better come to bed miss it is past eleven and you oughtn't to be out of your own cabin lady mary opened the door and faced the intruder your young lady is going to stay with me a little longer i will see that she goes back to her cabin in good time the tone of authority subdued the sour-faced person it is very late for miss brown to be out of her cabin she said sullenly and sullenly withdrew mary harding seated herself by the sobbing girl and tried to raise her drooping head let me comfort you if i can she said won't you tell me your trouble i might advise i might help you even i could at least do more than that disagreeable maid of yours don't be afraid to confide in me even if it is something very sad something that makes you ashamed the last few words were whispered as lady mary drew the girl's head to her bosom and gently smoothed the disordered hair with a motherly hand the hand that had caressed her boy's handsome head when he came to her flushed with the day's sport on the cricket ground or in the hunting field a hand that had not forgotten the maternal touch i want to tell you i must tell you now that you are leaving the ship now that we shall never meet again will you promise never to repeat what i tell you never to speak of me to any living creature yes i promise nothing you tell me to-night shall ever be repeated by me without your distinct permission then i will trust you i came here because i felt that i must tell you my heart was bursting but you will despise me you will loathe me when you know she struck her hand fiercely on the loose muslin that was folded over her breast the scarlet letter she cried 
the scarlet letter ought to be there the story was told in that speech my poor poor unhappy girl lady mary took her in her motherly arms and wept over her with more emotion than she had felt for any one not of her own kin she had suspected some evil thing from the beginning for the girl's trouble expressed itself in a way that could mean no common trouble the solitary voyage the stern-faced attendant every detail hinted at a ruined life a young life destroyed in its bloom a bud blighted and cankered before it could become a rose and the desolate creature was so lovely gifted with beauty that in happy surroundings in the sunlight of good luck might have made her one of society's queens whatever her fault had been however deep her fall mary harding's heart bled for her as she felt the young bosom heaving with convulsive sobs and the strained grip of the slender hands that clung to her arm we shall never meet again the girl said and i want you to know what an unhappy wretch i am she went on breathlessly in short sentences punctuated by sobs i only left school in england a year and a half ago i went to my father and mother in india i had not seen my father since i was a child i hardly remembered him except that he didn't care much for me and that he was often angry about trifles but my mother and i had been parted only two years and i adored her i was her only child there had been another a son but he died before he was a year old we adored each other there never was such a mother i flew into her arms when she came to meet me and i saw death in her face that was my first sorrow she only lived four months after i landed lived and suffered when she died i was alone in the world for i knew my father did not care for me he had another person to think about some one he had no right to care for before the hot weather began he sent me to cashmere with one of his nieces a colonel's wife who was gay and bright and kind and easy-going as everybody was in cashmere my father went with his friends to simla there was a pause the girl struggled with her sobs and lady mary waited patiently if you promise never 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 to repeat what i tell you i can trust you can't i i have never broken a promise after my mother died i used to lie awake half the night longing for her and thinking that there was no one in the world who loved me and for the rest of the night i used to dream that she was still alive and that we were happy when i woke from that dream it was almost the same every night i used to wish that i was dead but afterwards in cashmere i knew that there was another kind of love a love that dazzled me a love that wrapped me round like fire i was happy happy happier than words can tell she clung to lady mary she buried her face upon the matron's ample shoulder and for the first time that good christian felt a touch of repulsion i don't know why i loved him but his influence changed my life almost from the day we first met he was handsome fearless of man or beast strong-willed impetuous he gave me no peace till he had made me love him he took possession of my soul and made himself my master and it seemed sweet to obey him to know that he was always thinking about me and watching and following me we were always together my cousin encouraged him people said he was rich he was a great match she told me and i was a very lucky girl to have caught him vulgar wasn't it hideously vulgar said lady mary well we were often together and alone my cousin had her own pleasures and was always busy so she let me do what i liked we went for long forest rides we climbed lonely hills one evening at sunset when we had lost our way he repeated some verses of byron's a scene on a greek island haiti and juan and after that he used to call me haiti whenever we were alone then one day my cousin made a fuss and told him people were beginning to say ill-natured things about us and he must either declare himself or must go away and never see me again he said he must go if she thought fit for he was not free to marry he had thought of me only as a romantic child and had never imagined that any scandal could come of his liking for me a year ago when he was in america he had engaged himself to a boston girl an heiress her money was of no consequence to him for he was an only son and would be well off by and by but he was bound to the young lady in boston my cousin told me this and i listened to her without a word and she never knew that i was a lost creature scorched 
seared consumed by the fire of that dreadful love think what it was to have loved as haiti loved never to have doubted that i was to be his wife that i was to belong to him for ever and then to hear that we must part he was an insufferable villain said lady mary with clenched teeth oh i suppose other men are as cruel when girls are fools oh the shame of it the shame with a sudden rush of scalding tears the agony of knowing that i was an outcast for the rest of my life did you never see him again once he made his way to me at night he cried over me he threw himself upon the ground and cursed himself and beat his head upon the floor he told me that he would have made any sacrifice to have me for his wife if he had not been bound in honour to another girl her girl who would die if he jilted her i think he was sorry but he said i was so young and i would forget him and make a good match and perhaps be a great lady he did not know what you know whispered the girl with her face hidden no he never knew that he left cashmere after that night and you have never written to him never but others had to know wareham told my father he never spoke like a father to me after that he arranged for me to go to his sister in ireland i am to stay with her till he comes to fetch me it may be two years three years five six seven years poor child poor child lady mary found herself wanting in words of consolation to a woman of mature years with whom chastity was a habit of the mind such a fall as this the fall of a well-born well-bred girl was inconceivable she could better understand the outcast of the streets the village beauty betrayed and abandoned flung into a gulf as black as hell she was not without pity but she was without understanding she wanted to speak words of healing and comfort but the words would not come she could only think of the disgracefulness the shamefulness of the story a girl educated at a respectable english school a girl whose heart was still bleeding from the loss of a good mother a girl in the freshness of youth to whom the faintest touch of impurity should be horrible for such a one to fling herself into the arms of her first lover consumed by the fire of lawless love it was unthinkable how old are you she asked almost sternly i shall be eighteen in april your cousin was as wicked as your seducer to take no more care of a girl of seventeen the girl started to her feet releasing herself from lady mary's surrounding arms you are disgusted with me she said shortly i was a fool to tell you and some day if chance should bring us together again you will point me out to your friends as a disreputable creature unfit to mix with decent people i have given you my promise lady mary was of that modern anglican church which loves the things that belong to the old faith an ivory crucifix hung over her birth the girl had often looked at it with dreary eyes finding no comfort in the thought of a redeemer she looked at it now with a sudden purpose snatched it from the hook where it hung and put it into lady mary's hands swear she said upon this cross that you will never give me away the slang phrase was repellent at such a moment and lady mary answered stiffly i have promised she said that is enough no 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 it is not enough i hate myself for having babbled to you i shouldn't have done it if i were not distracted i must have your oath i know you are a religious woman and if you swear upon that crucifix you will not break your word mary harling lifted the sacred symbol to her lips i swear never to repeat what you have told me she said in a low grave voice and then putting her arm round the girl and making her sit down beside her she said gently you have been very hardly used yet you have i fear yourself to blame in some part for the trouble that has come upon your young life but your saviour will accept your atonement of shame and sorrow he has pardoned you as he pardoned the nameless woman who had sinned and saved her from the pharisee's fierce law you are very young and after some quiet years in ireland years in which you must cultivate your mind and try to do all the good that you possibly can to the people about you the poor people and children that you may find there in whom you can help and teach after those years which you can make years of atonement you may begin a new life you may feel yourself a new woman cleansed and purified by sorrow and good works and then lady mary repeated a sentence in the sermon she had been reading when jane brown came to her door 
which had come back to her mind while she sat dumb and unsympathetic forget mistakes organize victory out of mistakes that is what the noblest preacher i know of told sinners but in that happier time which you must hope for if a good man should give you his love and ask you to be his wife don't cheat him tell him all your sorrowful past don't shirk the shame of it if he really loves you he will forgive and take you to his heart don't palter with the truth beat your burden and be sure that truth is best i shall never marry i would rather go down to my grave alone than bear the shame of such a confession i have told you i could not tell a man least of all a man i loved i shall never marry unless 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 i were to meet him free to make me his wife she was weeping quietly subdued and perhaps a shade more hopeful presently she flung her arms round mary harling's neck will you let me kiss you she pleaded now that you know what i am lady mary kissed her warmly good-bye my dear some day perhaps when your life is happier you will write and tell me i shall be very glad to know that all is well with you no no don't waste a thought upon the wretched girl whose crying broke your night's rest you have been very kind to me and i am not ungrateful or sometimes perhaps when you open hawthorne's story think of me for a moment i shall often think of you and i want to hear from you years hence when you have lived down your sorrow but oh my poor girl lady mary went on in a lower voice if a living child is born to you don't withhold your love don't try to put the innocent creature from you try as much as your surroundings will suffer you to be a good mother the girl answered only with a hand clasp good-bye she sobbed and in the next instant the cabin door was closed and she had vanished out of mary harling's life or so mary harling thought End of chapter two chapter three of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three lady mary had made for herself a dignified position in the most respectable section of english society the people whose country houses were built on land that their ancestors had won from royal fear or favour before the wars of the roses and whose town houses had laid down red cloth for frederick prince of wales when newcastle was premier serious old houses in sober old streets where the iron extinguishers that flank the doorstep tell of lovely devonshire sedan chair and running footmen of the gunnings and the walpoles lady mary's friends were the kind of people who do not worship new money or apologize for going to the entertainments of mammon for the sake of music or gobble june peaches while they ridicule the providers of the feast lady mary's was a quiet world in which people set a tremendous value upon themselves exaggerated no doubt but still a kind of self-respect that kept them out of unclean paths lady mary's friends wanted to know a great deal about everybody who crossed their sacred thresholds or whose thresholds they crossed who was she what has he done where do they come from the splendid house the sumptuous feasting the costly music counted for nothing no doubt they are very nice but we don't want to know them that was the attitude of lady mary's friends to the newly rich and newly popular writers politicians actors and artists of all kinds were admitted on their merits and while they were observed to behave themselves properly but for the bad-mannered man the bounder or the cad there was short shrift invited once he was never asked again unless he were well born and then bad manners were described as eccentricity the scions of great houses could not do wrong lady mary had married a great shipbuilder it was a low marriage of course but had been tolerated on the ground of the man's unobtrusive manners and a certain grave dignity that might have become a duke his father had been rich before him and the son had been reared among the salt of the earth at eton and oxford lady mary was a duke's daughter and had brought her mate ten thousand pounds for two potage which was not a liberal portion considering the duke's wealth john harling could afford to brush aside the ducal dower as a negligible quantity when he dictated his marriage settlement he gave his wife a thousand a year for pin-money 
and when a mortal disease came upon him eleven years after his marriage he left her fifteen thousand a year during widowhood to be reduced to five thousand if she married and to five hundred if she married a man ten years younger than herself she was only thirty when he made his will with certain death near at hand and he wanted to guard her from the evil to come he told himself that while her boy was young her plaything and her idol she would not want to marry but that later in her mature years she might be a mark for the impecunious guardsman or the foreign adventurer lady mary's portion came from funded property but her son inherited his father's interest in the great shipbuilding firm which had been made into a limited liability company with the accumulations of a long minority and the increasing prosperity of the business conrad would have not less than thirty thousand a year when he came of age but before his twenty-first birthday conrad harling had been condemned to imprisonment for life and his fortune remained in the custody of his trustees who were men of position and impeccable honesty it was the worst kind of imprisonment the most hopeless the most melancholy mental specialists grave gentlemen from hardy street and savile row had sat in judgment upon him and had given their gloomy verdict for life they could see no prospect of cure it was one of those cases of loss of memory which are of all phases of mental derangement the most hopeless it was not that something had gone mysteriously wrong with the mental machinery something that might come mysteriously right the machine was broken the main spring of intelligence had snapped the man remained a magnificent man a picture or a statue of splendid manhood but the mind was cancelled doctors from paris doctors from berlin and vienna agreed with harley street and savile row conrad harling he who had been so much more alive than the ruck of men was practically dead he paced the leafy avenues of a park at roehampton with a keeper at his side though there was no need of a keeper for the house surgeon's report described the young man as harmless harmless he to be so described who at twenty had been like absalom in his beauty like hamlet in his distinction the observed of all observers the glass of fashion and the mould of form he who had been a star at eton and christ church admired followed imitated beloved an easy first in those accomplishments that youth worships in one word an oxford blue stroke of the christ church eight captain of the christ church eleven on the scholastic side he had not done wonders but everybody knew that he was clever and at twenty much might be hoped from him he was his mother's idol she lived only to worship him and to maintain the dignity the reserve the aloofness from all unworthy people and paltry things incumbent upon conrad's mother she thought of herself almost as if she had been a queen regent and regulated every act of her life by conrad's interests she looked forward to his coming of age as if it were to revolutionize the world or at least to begin a new chapter in english history with his means with his gifts his splendid presence his happy self-assurance and spontaneous eloquence to what heights of statesmanship and parliamentary renown might he not aspire she smiled when his college tutor told her that he was irregular at lectures and had very little goo for aristotle or greek tragedy what did it matter to a heaven-born orator who would take the house by storm and recall the splendid flights of that famous charles townsend described by walpole without townsend's failings he would come of age in a year she had begun to make plans and to discuss the festivities the banquets and benefactions the rural sports and wide-stretching hospitalities that were to make his twenty-first birthday memorable all over the county she talked of nothing else to her bailiff and house steward in her summer visit to cranford it is my son's house she reminded them i only occupy it by his courtesy and when he marries i shall move to the grange the grange was on the other side of the park and its garden skirted the churchyard it was tudor and picturesque and handsomer than the average dower house but lady mary felt as if she would be laying down crown and sceptre when she left the great georgian mansion and the family portraits she was full of brilliant ideas for the coming of age festivities conrad's birthday was in august the month of golden grain and scarlet poppies and orchards brimming over with red and amber fruit the month of fertility and rich colour gaudy flowers and crimson sunsets lady mary would have everything early english a reminiscence of frith's picture coming of age in ye olden time her pet idea was a maypole dance on the village green which was lovely and unspoilt by cockney influences 
and the maypole might be left standing and the young people encouraged to dance on summer evenings she had reformed the village inn which had thriven upon the new system and was a favourite shelter for cyclists and pedestrians who were sure of crisp loaves and succulent cheese well-brewed tea and homemade jam at the harling arms everything in lady mary's dominion made for prettiness and her tenants and tradespeople and farm labourers had prospered exceedingly during her gracious regency nor was there any fear of evil times when the king began his reign benevolence and kindness would be the order of the day sustained by an ever-increasing income from the famous company in which conrad was the largest shareholder with no more arduous duty than to sit as chairman at a half-yearly meeting and draw his half-yearly dividends and then perhaps a few years after that joyous festival would come marriage and another ringing of bells and broaching of hogsheads lady mary did not wish her son to marry till he was at least four-and-twenty she would indeed have chosen twenty-six or twenty-seven as the marrying age when he had seen the world and had been in parliament for two or three years she wanted him to be free from all domestic cares in the beginning of his political career twenty-seven would be best she knew of half a dozen lovely girls now in the nursery or schoolroom girls born exactly as she would wish her daughter-in-law to be born in surroundings of unblemished respectability fortified by blue blood for lady mary's son blue blood was indispensable although she had descended from her patrician perch in marrying that excellent man his father having married mr harling she meant that the harling money should secure a patrician wife for mr harling's son the girls were growing up for him he who was so handsome and attractive so superlatively gifted in the accomplishments girls admire cricket tennis horsemanship dancing would have his choice among half a dozen beauties in their first season his mother meant to give him a free hand she would never dictate she would not even suggest but she would lead him through the gardens of fresh-blown roses and let his eye and his heart choose the flower that was to be the crown of his young life and while she was dreaming of her son's marriage in his twenty-sixth year conrad harling was going mad for love of an innkeeper's daughter and had turned socialist in his desire to level himself down to her he was a romantic young man full of high-flown sentiments and wild quixotism and he took up karl marx with an enthusiasm he had refused to aristotle he gave vent to republican views in red-hot speeches at the union reviled rank and state and raved about the equal rights of men and he was firmly resolved upon marrying stella meadows whose father kept the otter's head a favourite resort for boating men within a week of the long vacation he surprised and disappointed his mother by announcing that he meant to stay at abington and read and do a good deal of rowing so as to get himself in good form for next year when there was every chance of his being in the varsity eight he would go to her for a day or two now and then if she was at cranford or would meet her in london if she had any occasion to go there lady mary was sorry but after all it was important that he should prepare to face the examiners and if he could do better by himself in quiet riverside lodgings than touring in wales or scotland with a reading party his mother could have no objection she did not expect to enjoy much of his society in the long it was happiness enough to see him occasionally in high health and spirits to accompany him on the round of inspection on the estate and to find him pleased with all she had done intensely interested in the stables and his stud of hunters in the kennels where his shooting dogs threatened to repeat the tragedy of actaeon out of exuberant love in lady mary's herd of jerseys and even in so tame a thing from the masculine standpoint as the gardens that were his mother's pride and joy but this year all was changed he came he was kind and interested in her health and went with her wherever she asked him stables farmyard kennels gardens but it was too clear that all savour had gone out of these familiar things he would not even have the cloths taken off his horses when they were brought out into the ancient quadrangle that'll do brand he told the stud groom they look in fine condition he gave his adoring setters and spaniels hardly three minutes and left them disappointed with great brown eyes looking at him reproachfully as he backed out of the old half-timbered building where they lived in the broken light from a window in the roof through which the sunshine came fitfully between the dusk of massive oak rafters juno looked miserable when you wouldn't notice her his mother said as they left the yard conrad was not conscious of the reproach he hardly noticed anything 
except in an automatic way that made his mother unhappy his mind was not there his thoughts and interests were miles away what was amiss was it debt his allowance was on the top scale of college allowances or a little above the highest scale but the capacity of undergraduates for getting into debt is supposed to be without limit and however much they have there is always the something more that they spend he had been losing money at cards perhaps or he had been backing a friend's horses and he was ashamed to tell her he looked pale and careworn her heart went out to him with infinite pity if it had been possible for him to squander his fortune in one year of folly to mortgage every acre and sell his patrimony to the jews and to reduce her to beggary his mother's power to love and pity would not have been exhausted she would have gone out of her ruined home with him hand in hand as adam and eve went out of eden disconsolate but not reproachful she questioned him gently she was sure there was something on his mind something that worried him and had been worrying him for some time would he not trust her if he had lost money in some rather foolish way he could draw on her for any sum he wanted to make things square without troubling his trustees she had a good balance at her bankers you dear old mother he exclaimed and he spoke with more animation than he had shown hitherto no i have not outrun the constable though i did spend more last term than i generally spend not betting no dear it went upon trifles foolish things but no harm but i know you have something serious on your mind conrad oh a fellow ought to have something to think of besides the college boat there is nothing wrong nothing that need trouble you when you are on your knees but you have hit the mark i have been thinking of something serious not the church what turn parson no you dear simpleton that's not in my line don't be impatient mother there shall be no secrets between you and me but you must let me take my own time he smiled down at her his face had grown suddenly radiant with the look she loved she called it his noble look an expression in which she saw truth and courage and honour and all good gifts that well-born youth should have a light flashed into her mind conrad was in love in love before his time seven years before the date that her sagacious mind had allotted for his marriage some pretty sister of one of his oxford friends had caught his youthful fancy perhaps a nobody's pretty sister a country vicar's daughter one of many but even if it were so it could but be calf love a boy's first fancy for a lovely face or a face that seemed lovely to that ardent young imagination such loves are light as children's soap bubbles look as dazzling in their iridescent glory and melt and pass like them she was not going to fret herself if her beloved boy had taken first love like measles or chicken-pox a complaint that had to be get through somehow her only regret was that the youthful malady seemed to have taken a gloomy form he was out of spirits absent-minded too evidently worried and perplexed even a mother's solicitude underestimated the evil for a young man of conrad's impassioned temperament first love must be disastrous if it be not happy with him love began at fever point from the hour he made the acquaintance of the prosperous innkeeper's petted daughter overdressed educated up to the highest all-round smattering point kept aloof from the bar in its vulgarities chaperoned by a spinster aunt who never snubbed an eligible undergraduate but rather contrived those casual introductions that can be brought about so easily on the river where there is always some kind of excitement and something of a festal air and one undergraduate having somehow introduced himself to aunt and niece was able to introduce others till the heiress of the otter's head had her following of nice boys and was established as an acknowledged beauty she was very pretty in the first freshness of girlhood she had that exquisite purity of colouring a fairness as of madonna lilies from which the idea of virginal innocence seems inseparable the sensitive complexion with its quick blushes the lucid blue of the large wondering eyes shining through golden lashes the flaxen hair all had an angelic character which was so out of harmony with coquetry and slyness that no experience of her cruelty or her want of truth could shake the lad's faith or startle him from his dream of bliss he had known her something less than half a year and he had been made to suffer every pang which slighted love can feel every joy that love triumphant can taste her smiles and kisses 
her frowns and coldness the moonlit nights when she would stroll with him in dewy lanes amid the subtle scent of hedgerow flowers and fields of blossoming beans his arm enfolding her slight form his eyes drinking the beauty of her face angelic in the magical moonlight my angel my wife he would murmur in those blissful moments the heavenly interludes in which he thought she loved him never for one brief flash had his mind harboured a thought dishonouring her that she could ever be anything less than his wife the first and most precious of women was impossible she was his first and last love a passion that had mastered heart and mind a passion that shut out every other thought and made existence one long dream of the woman he loved such a passion could have no second it is once and for ever he said when she told him that he would go away and forget her he had spent the greater part of his college allowance on jewels to deck his divinity but here that cold common sense which sometimes chilled him as out of harmony with the angelic came into play she would accept the gifts of her future husband but she would not wear them as the daughter of the otter's head people would laugh at pearls and diamonds on an innkeeper's girl she told him she was not elated at the idea of marrying him indeed there were times when she told him their marriage was a foolish dream that would never be realized she was a creature of moods and fancies capricious unreasonable and she kept him under the harrow by her cold fits and hot fits her hours of yielding love her hours of coldness and restraint so determined was he upon having her and only her to share his fortune and rule his life that in opposition to her wish he called upon the landlord of the otter's head and made a formal offer of his hand the man received the flattering proposition gravely and with something of embarrassment it's a serious thing for a gentleman like you to think of marrying a publican's daughter he said and you're very young sir to make up your mind about marriage hardly of age yet i take it i shall be twenty-one next year and i have made up my mind and what about stella she's a bit of a flirt you must know though i say it as shouldn't are you quite sure of her yes she gave me her promise last night it was not the first time but it was the first time i felt sure quite sure that she loves me his face was radiant as he remembered those impassioned vows all her capricious moods her slights her coldness were forgotten she had given him unmistakable tokens of a love fervid as his own her arms had been round his neck her lovely head nestling on his shoulder and heart had been beating against heart in passionate unison while that fond vow was spoken your wife dearest never any man's wife but yours never 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 and then had come a flood of tears and stormy sobs that threatened hysteria and it had been his tender care to soothe her shaken nerves to comfort her with happy talk about their future and now her father who might naturally be supposed to receive such an offer with gratification if not astonishment discussed the situation with a troubled brow and perplexed manner of course it's a great chance for my girl he said hesitatingly everybody knows mr harling why i remember your father sir thirty years ago when he was at christ church a famous scholar i believe yes my father took a much better degree than his son is likely to take never mind that sir he never had your form on the river but to return to my girl does your ma know of your intentions not yet she will know in good time and i have no doubt of her approval when she sees stella she is the kindest of women and her only wish is for my happiness you see sir it don't often happen for a gentleman of your wealth and position your ma with a handle to her name i'm told to marry a girl out of a pub i'm afraid her ladyship might cut up rough and make it unpleasant for you i don't want you to trouble yourself about that conrad said with a touch of hauteur i mean to marry stella within a week of my coming of age that will give time for my mother to know and appreciate my future wife you see i am not going to work in a hot-headed way but it was only right that you should be told of your daughter's engagement and should have no doubt as to the propriety of her conduct when you happen to see her or to hear of her in my company the innkeeper was somewhat moved by this speech you're a trump sir he said i wish there was more like you and-and you're a great catch for my girl 
and i hope she'll prove worthy of her luck but she's very young and she's been a bit giddy you see she's out and away the prettiest girl between oxford and abingdon and the undergrads and and others have made a fool of her she lost her mother when she was eleven years old and i've been too busy to look after her much i sent her to the best school i could hear of a boarding school for gentlemen's daughters it was a favour to take her but the school wasn't doing well and went bankrupt soon after she kicked over the traces a bit at school couldn't stand the rules and regulations and then i got my maiden sister to come and take care of her but my sister's a featherhead she was something of a beauty herself in her time and was made so much of that she could never bring herself to accept a husband in her own walk of life and i don't know whether she has been quite the best sort of person to look after stella stella has too much self-respect to want looking after conrad said he knew the aunt and considered her a foolish person but he believed in his divinity's intelligence as he believed in her purity now sir if you really intend to make stella your wife in a twelvemonth from now i should like with all deference to offer you a bit of advice let me send her away from oxford and the river and the class of people that hang about my house i've kept her out of the business she never drew a glass of beer in her life but there it is you may call a public-house an hotel and furnish your sitting-rooms up to date but public-house it is all the same we must get stella out of it you'll want her to be made a lady before you marry her and there's only one way that it can be done as far as i can see she was eighteen on her last birthday so she's not too old for a good finishing school a school where they teach deportment and such like if you'll find out where there is such a school leamington perhaps or in the neighbourhood of reading an out-and-out -out good school where the schoolmistress is a real lady and can be depended on i'll send stella there for a year i don't mind what it costs i want to make a lady of her and to get her away from people i don't like that's flat he thumped his honest fist upon the table and spoke with a determination that startled conrad it was as if a doctor were proposing some heroic treatment in a desperate case i hate the idea of schoolmistresses they would make her prim and artificial they would kill the charm of my wild rose you must have her made a lady sir she mustn't stop here conrad argued the point sturdily but stella's father was resolute i know what i'm about he said the otter's head is no place for her i've been wanting to get her away for the last six months and now i'll do it it'll be the making of her he was going to say the saving of her but chose the less ominous word conrad had to submit he told stella of the plan in their evening walk she was angry with her father and contemptuous about his views she was angry with her lover for consenting to degrade her i suppose you think i am ignorant that i pronounce words wrong and i'm not fit to mix with genteel people he soothed and petted her told her she was his ideal lady but she must not talk of people being genteel she had better forget that there was such a word in the language there was nothing derogatory in a finishing school it was not his idea but her father's for his own part he would not have her changed in the most trifling detail if there were some little differences between her and the girls he had met elsewhere those slight divergencies only made her more fascinating she listened and was soothed and appeared to agree to her father's plan he left her in hot haste to discover the ideal seminary in which just that last polishing process might be applied to the lovely statue just the artistic treatment that would embellish without altering his goddess he took the first train to london and went about among the few immaculate matrons with whom he was on friendly terms surprising them by his eagerness for information on a subject that seemed hardly within the range of his interests three out of five knew nothing of schools and shuddered at the notion of anything but home education for so precious a being as a girl child the other two knew hard cases of anglo-indian children who had to be brought up at school and each had her pet establishment her incomparable missus who could create the perfection of girlhood out of the most unpromising material two of the incomparable missus had a handsome house and gardens at eastbourne quite away from the town and the parade and all the holiday people don't you know an abode of refined dullness conrad imagined 
where a pupil might die of ennui without ever having run against a vulgar person the back windows commanded a distant view of the grounds of compton place this in itself gave a cachet nobody happened to know of any establishment at leamington or reading conrad tore down to eastbourne by cab and train catching the afternoon express with a rush and drove in a fly to mandeville house where miss mandeville and miss amelia mandeville fostered all that was delectable in girlhood and eliminated every weed in their garden of girls it was a sunny afternoon and the plain white house facing southwest was glorified every scarlet stripe in the spanish blinds a flash of intense colour the lawns and geranium beds dazzling nowhere did he remember to have seen such purple clematis such amber roses such scarlet cannas everything was steeped in sunlight it was the kind of afternoon that raises an english landscape to the colour point of italy girls were playing tennis their white frocks flashing in the sun their joy in the game breaking into peals of light laughter miss amelia mandeville took him round the house and the grounds everywhere he found perfection the desires and the ways of girls studied with a forethought and sympathy that surprised him he had supposed that schoolmistresses considered girlhood their natural enemy and took infinite pains to traverse and stifle girlish instincts here infinite pains had been taken to realize every wish and gratify every natural taste beauty was the dominant note the spinsters had eyes for form and colour and a catholicity of taste in all things beautiful the house stood on high ground half a mile from the coast and the sea beheld from afar was a glorified sea sapphire and gold against the verdant middle distance everything pleased conrad surely his dearest girl would be happy there for the year of their engagement only one little year before she would be mistress of his home and all that home implies for a man of large means yes assuredly she would be happy the change from those unworthy surroundings at the otter's head would make this place seem paradise he remembered that there were details small differences in her forms of speech that wanted refining away for him all she said was enchanting but the women among whom his wife would have to live are critical about trifles they have their shibboleth and if they talk bad english it must be their own kind of bad english upon accent they are to be the last degree intolerant and they would boycott an angel with a cockney twang and there were accents of stella's that touched the boundary line of vulgarity when she was angry or excited conrad began to think highly of his future father-in-law's wisdom of course it must be his privilege to pay the charges of mandeville house which were on a scale in accordance with the luxuries and refinements of the establishment he rushed back to oxford by a night train too late to visit his enchantress he lay awake thinking of her picturing her among those happy girls he had seen on the tennis lawn the fairest were all were fair the most divine he went to the otter's head in the early morning before breakfast she was not an early riser but perhaps she might feel some of his own impatience for their meeting after his absence of one long day and she might be curious to hear his account of the ideal seminary that was to make her as perfect in speech and manner as she was exquisite in personal charm the innkeeper met him with a scared white face i've got some bad news for you sir he said he led the young man into his den behind the bar the room where he kept his accounts and where he sat of an evening with a crony or two or with a solitary pipe while his daughter and her aunt were in their drawing-room upstairs where they could have their own visitors aloof from vulgarity she's gone she's gone sir cut and run the the his speech closed huskily with a hideous epithet that was doubly horrible when linked with the name of his daughter and then for the first time since he entered into his fool's paradise conrad harding was told what kind of woman he had loved it didn't seem a father's place to give her away the innkeeper said but i spoke as plain as i dared and i thought that having been lucky enough to meet with a gentleman of your mettle willing to make a lady of her she'd have turned over a new leaf i never thought she'd have anything more to do with him and then conrad learnt that he had a rival and such a rival a prize fighter the champion middleweight famous in the sporting world an olive-skinned gladiator with close-cropped hair of raven blackness a blue chin a broken nose and a drunken wife 
he had come to abingdon for a holiday while he was out of training and he had stayed at the otter's head the centre of an admiring company an attraction to the jovial bar a profitable guest conrad had seen him sculling in the sunshine the muscular arms bare to the shoulder the supple form shining like pale bronze this was the man she loved the master she obeyed the brute force that had subjugated her trivial nature while the young undergraduate's passion had only flattered her vanity she had left her father's house in the early morning and had gone to liverpool with her rough lover on the first stage of their flight to america where the pugilist had a profitable engagement the drunken wife was left in an oxford slum and stella's letter posted on the journey told her father what she had made of her life she was leaving england perhaps for ever with the only man she had ever loved they would be married in america where he could easily get a divorce and where he would be a rich man conrad listened in a stony silence all the life had gone out of his bloodless face his eyes those splendid blue eyes had become dull and expressionless he stood with stella's letter in his hand staring at the words as if they had no meaning can i see her aunt he asked at last she knows more than you do perhaps yes curse her she knows more than enough she can tell me now that it's too late they always do those women if ever i had a dishonest barman they'd tell me about him fast enough when he was gone it's a way they have curse them they're a bad lot sir every one of em rotten to the core he threw his cloth cap at his favourite bull terrier and then mixed a stiff brandy and soda it was easy to guess where this bereft father would look for consolation have a drink sir no i'll go and see your sister he knew his way to the gaudy little upstairs room facing the river the room in which he had spent many an hour with aunt and niece a favoured visitor the crochet antimacassars and stuffed trout and pike the beaded reed blinds and blue ginger jars the mixture of early victorian and cheap japanese had set his teeth on edge even in stella's bewitching company and he had yearned to see her in the grave old rooms at cranford the rooms were things of beauty curios porcelain pictures hardly counted in the effect of panelled walls and atom doors and mantelpieces and all the glory of cedar shadowed lawns and italian garden he found the elder miss meadows with swollen eyelids and every sign of tribulation but loquacious in her grief she covered herself with reproaches and gave him no time to blame her as he had been disposed to do so even amidst her incoherence he heard only too much heard how the sweet simplicity he had adored was the varnish of an unscrupulous coquette how she had carried on that was the aunt's phrase with mr so-and-so of balliol and lord so-and-so of bray's nose how the carryings on had begun when she was sixteen and how it was only by reason of her aunt's prudential measures that worse things had not happened conrad had to listen while she expatiated upon stella's artfulness and let in strange lights upon the career of a plebeian beauty the presents the treats the carrying on those arms that had clung round his neck so tenderly the dimpled cheek that had pressed against his own those exquisite lips whose fragrance he had drunk were the hackneyed charms of a low-bred wanton he heard that cataract of vulgar speech in a strange silence he looked as he had looked in the innkeeper's snuggery like flesh turned into stone except to ask to see this woman he had hardly spoken since he came into the house he made no comment upon the story she told him he went out of the house in the same frozen silence and walked away with his face to the west and the towered city of oxford saw him no more end of chapter three chapter four of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four as conrad had been living in lodgings and was supposed to have been reading his disappearance made no stir the ways of undergraduates in vacation being erratic mr harling's landlady supposed that her agreeable lodger had gone to his own people on the whim of the moment and had not considered it necessary to inform her of his movements the fact of his having taken no luggage was easily explained in the supposition that he had gone home it was not till after four letters with the cranford park address on the envelopes had been followed by a flight of telegrams at three-hour intervals that the lady of the riverside villa took fright 
she telegraphed to the lady of cranford park whose photograph in an ivory frame stood on the book-table in conrad's deserted sitting-room mr harling left here on wednesday morning september seventh she followed the telegram with a letter in which she described the suddenness of her lodger's departure and how on account of her experience of undergraduate ways she had attached no importance to the fact then came for lady mary harling a period of harrowing anxiety such as happily is rare in the tragedy of domestic life her son had disappeared from the world of living creatures the river or the railroad or the woods and solitary places round oxford might hide the tragic close of that young life but those graves of youth and hope those last refuges of despair refused to give up their secret the most indefatigable search persevered and without rest or respite for five weary weeks the investigations of trained investigators men who had graduated in scotland yard and retired upon private practice full of knowledge and experience could make nothing of the case of conrad harling the investigators were somewhat handicapped by the instructions of their client for in the midst of her grief lady mary had been so much a woman of the world as to stipulate that the search for her son should be carried on with the utmost secrecy no detail no suggestion of the tragedy was to find its way to the newspaper press and thus the clues that are most often furnished by the outside public were wanting to her private police not even her most intimate friends knew that her son was missing even the college dons were left in the dark her agents opined that they could afford no assistance five weeks of agonizing suspense of sleepless nights or briefest slumbers made horrible by visions of death and then came a summons to a little seaport town in north cornwall where in a humble inn the resort of sailors and fishermen a young man had been found whose appearance corresponded with her son's photograph and whose presence in that locality had given rise to considerable curiosity lady mary received this summons in hertford street where she had been living throughout these weeks of trouble in order to be within easy reach of her agents the telegram came in time for her to start in the eleven o'clock express for padstow accompanied by daisy meredith her only confidant who insisted on going with her and in the golden evening sunlight she was sitting in the inn parlour alone with her son he sat by her side he let her hold his hand he let her kiss him but he kept a stony silence and his eyes looked at her with a vacant stare he was quite mad his mother was told the story of his coming to that place in rags with his shoes worn off his feet and in appearance a tramp but with a valuable watch and a handful of gold and silver in his pocket he had a gaunt and hungry look and was footsore a doctor had been called in by the innkeeper and had pronounced him mad but harmless his madness might be only temporary a passing cloud he had been living at the little inn for a month wandering about on the hills or lying on the beach all day the innkeeper had bought ready-made clothes and other necessaries for him with some of the money found upon him and had done all that could be done to make him comfortable but his silence made a barrier between him and the outer world he sat among the noisy company in the inn parlour when the room was full of talk and laughter thick with the smoke of seafaring pipes sat in a corner by the projecting chimney not heeding them he ate the food that was put before him but showed no preferences no desires the innkeeper sent a lad to watch him when he roamed about the hills lest he should try to make away with himself but he had shown no suicidal impulses he only wandered aimlessly or sat staring at the sea why he had made his way to that particular spot and why he stayed there who could tell his mother asked no questions she clasped her living son in her arms the son she had thought of among the dead and this was much she took possession of him the local doctor got her an attendant from plymouth and she carried her son to london and installed him in his own rooms in hetford street never to part with him till the wound in that beautiful mind was healed and he was again a free man and master of his life she made up her mind that he should never know the restraints that other mental sufferers know she would be his nurse and his keeper this was lady mary's plan but unhappily it did not work she had to yield to scientific opinion he would be better away from her whatever chance of recovery there might be and her advisers did not hide from her that the chances were small his residence under her roof the restrictions of his life while he was an unacknowledged lunatic would lessen that chance the constant supervision of experienced doctors and nurses was necessary for his welfare love could do little for him love that he did not recognize or understand 
lady mary yielded to medical opinion after a hard struggle it was true that her love could do nothing for him he did not notice her coming or going she sat beside him for hours without winning one glance of recognition she had heard the story of his love madness from the landlord of the otter's head she knew that the fever of one brief summer a lad's extravagant passion for worthless beauty had withered his young life a wanton's perfidy had killed the happy boy whose path lay in the sunshine for whom she had anticipated a life of fame and gladness all god's good gifts nature's lavish bounty were turned to dust and ashes one consideration that influenced lady mary was the better chance of keeping her son's secret if he were hidden in a private asylum lost sight of by the outside world a unit in the sum of sorrow enclosed by the walls of the spacious wooded grounds surrounding a house on the edge of putney heath so near london that it would be easy for her to visit him and yet so secluded and aloof from the busy world that no one need discover his retreat a physician of experience and position was at the head of the establishment and the system and details were the highest outcome of modern science and modern thought nowhere could this martyr of a foolish love dream be better cared for and if his reason should some day awaken from the long apathy of melancholy madness no one need know how the interval in his life had been spent it would be easy for his mother to tell her friends that he was a traveller in faraway places in central africa central asia anywhere such wanderings are the natural diversions of youth and wealth lady mary for whom truthfulness was an instinct taught herself the delicate art of lying and in the earlier years of her son's seclusion that new learning came into play for she was often questioned about him most of all in the first year why had he left the varsity boys are so erratic she said and having found that phrase she used it freely to answer for everything her son was all that was good and dear but he was erratic central africa was his passion she never knew where he was at any moment of her life yes of course she admitted in reply to friendly questions he wrote to her sometimes but the postal arrangements of uganda were not quite perfect no she was not unhappy about him she knew how steady he was how brave how clever yes naturally he had companions he was not a solitary wanderer and so this martyr of maternal love spoke of her son while the empty shell the simulacrum of that which was once her son was pacing the avenue at roehampton or sitting in the sunshine dead in life the mere mechanical life of pulses that beat and limbs that can move she went to see him two or three times a week when she was in london and sat with him in his pretty parlour where the french windows faced south and open on a gracious flower garden he never recognised her he had no occupations no tastes no desires the days came and went and made no change in him the summer after lady mary's autumn voyage to ceylon there came a gleam of hope conrad had taken a fancy to one of the doctor's dogs a handsome irish setter it was the first thing animate or inanimate that his eyes had rested on with interest since he entered that sad world he patted the dog and coaxed her to follow him to his room one day he called her juno the name of his favourite at cranford that was the first ray of memory the doctor told lady mary that he saw in this a faint hope of ultimate cure it looks as if the machine might work again he said even this faint hope was much the setter became conrad's constant companion walked with him ate with him slept upon his bed and his interest in her never diminished but with his mother he remained cold and unrecognizing once indeed while she was sitting with him he looked at her and then pointed to the dog but he spoke no word this was the second summer after the winter in ceylon she went to italy in the autumn and spent a quiet contemplative winter in the old cities perugia verona bologna siena studying art and architecture with daisy meredith who was always ready to take up any study to be interested in even any fad an admirable companion with a bright mind that caught fire at a spark it was while she was at siena and before the trunks were packed for home that there came a letter from roehampton a letter that changed the colour of lady mary's existence your son's mental condition has made such marked improvement within the last month that i think i may now venture to give you every hope of his recovery his brain has awakened from the lethargy that has so long obscured his consciousness of the outer world 
and from the hour when he first noticed the house surgeon's dog there has been a gradual revival of his intelligence which within the last month has advanced by leaps and bounds you will be astonished at the change and though i would not advise his return to active life for some time to come i have the strongest faith in his being ultimately able to resume his proper place in society two days after reading this letter mary harding was at roehampton it was a lovely afternoon in april and the beeches and elms and wide lawns and beds of tulips were glorified in the sunshine and seemed scarcely less beautiful to the mother's eager eyes than the land of blossoming chestnuts and trailing vines through which the train de luxe had carried her speeding homeward with her thoughts one perpetual thanksgiving to god for her son's deliverance she stood at the french window in conrad's sitting-room and saw him coming towards her across the lawn alert and active with rapid step and happy face handsomer than in his boyhood his dog leaping about him they clasped hands and he kissed her in the old boyish way my dear mother she could not speak she was almost fainting but she was just able to get to a chair and sit down with her son beside her the setter made a diversion by thrusting herself between them jealous of the stranger you are as fond as ever of juno lady mary said and these were the first words she could find she's a dear thing but her name isn't juno though i call her by the old name now and then this one is flirt madame flirt the dog's paws were on his shoulders and his face was being violently licked is juno alive still he asked presently and the question told his mother that he knew of the lapse of years yes she is flourishing poor old dear she must be very old thirteen last birthday yes i remember she was five the year i went to christ church there came a silence his mother's eyes were clouded with tears as she looked at him and it was impossible for her to repress all signs of agitation but he was perfectly calm his eyes had a thoughtful look serenely meditative lady mary looked round the room he had lived in during those weary years his table was loaded with books and there was his old eton desk which he had sent there hopeless of his ever using it now open and with sheets of manuscript scattered about it she looked at the books darwin wallace tyndall claude and several new books on electricity you have taken up science she said full of wonder yes it is a new world for me the house doctor here is a dab at electrical science and we have long jaws together but i hope you indulge yourself with a little light literature thackeray dickens and the poets you were so fond of they are by my bedside my close companions i have a good deal of leisure for reading you see now i have gone back to books and you take plenty of exercise i play lawn tennis or croquet whenever the weather is possible and court tennis every day of course you know we have a tennis court you look in splendid health i believe i am in splendid health the head boss here says i ought to join you in your autumn trip india ceylon or wherever your dear old fogies send you for your asthma would you like that mother or would you think me a bore this was more than mary harling could stand she burst into tears that kept her speechless for some minutes the house doctor seemed to have been within earshot of her sobs the windows being all open in the soft spring weather he came in through the veranda and carried lady mary and her son to his own den where he gave them tea and where the conversation touched only on the lightest and pleasantest topics with many inquiries about lady mary's winter travels the pictures she had seen juliet's grave historical verona the cathedral at siena the old palace at perugia End of chapter four